Recently, you may have heard in the news about a new artificial intelligence program called ChatGPT. This is a program that, well, you can talk to, you can ask questions, and it gives you answers that actually are pretty smart answers, and it almost sounds like it's another person you're chatting with rather than a computer. In today's video, I thought we would ask ChatGPT some pretty tough investing and retirement questions to see, well, just how good it is. Hey everybody, my name is Rob Berger. This is the Financial Freedom Show where we talk about investing, retirement, and financial freedom. If those topics are of interest to you, I encourage you to subscribe to the channel. I also send out a newsletter every Sunday morning. You can subscribe to the newsletter in the link below this video. I've been playing around with ChatGPT and I gotta tell you, it's not perfect, but boy, does it give some really good answers to some questions that I wouldn't think it would necessarily have smart answers for. So I started testing investing and retirement questions with ChatGPT, and we're gonna take a look at it sort of in real time. This is gonna be unedited. So I'm gonna start typing questions in and whatever it gives us, it gives us. You ready? Let's get started. And um, I thought I'd just start with the basics. What is ChatGPT? Maybe it'll give us some information here that can be useful to understand what it is. Now I'm gonna make this a little bit bigger. Hopefully you can see it, there we go. And it gives you, it starts to type out, as you can see, text, GPT, and, and, or generative, generative pre-trained transformer. Okay, I'm already lost. It's a type of language model developed by OpenAI. Uh, it is a deep learning model that is trained to generate human-like text by predicting the next word. Now, that's really important. This, it's not as if it's searching Google and searching the internet and coming up with some information it got from some website and simply putting it here. Uh, on the screen for us, it's actually predicting uh, the next words that it would expect to see following, in this case, the prompt, which was the question I asked it. And uh, so in that sense, it's kind of a, a dumb system. It doesn't actually know what it's saying, at least as I understand it. And keep in mind, I majored in English in college, but it's basically just predicting based on, I'm going to assume, uh, the assessment of millions and millions of, 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 of texts of, you know, from the internet and other sources, predicting what the next word's going to be. But the result is pretty smart. We can go back to it. It says GPT can be used for a variety of natural language processing tasks. All right, well, there it is. Let's, uh, let's put it to the test. Let's start with uh, what is investing? Can it help us with that? What's it say? It's an act of putting money into financial assets or other ventures with the expectation of earning a profit. So, you know, it sounds pretty good to me. There are many different types of investments. Fine. Stocks, bonds, mutual funds, real estate, commodities. Boy, this is sounding pretty good. The goal of investing is to grow your wealth over time by earning returns on your investments. There are many factors that can affect your returns and so on and so forth. I won't read the whole thing, but that's not bad. It says investing is a, can be a complex process and it's important to do thorough research. Okay. I like it. Well, how about this? How should I invest for, we're gonna get more specific as we go along, for retirement. It's an important financial planning decision, good. Requires careful consideration, got it. They give us some steps. Determine your retirement savings goal. How much money will you need to save? All right, well, that's, I can't argue with that. Uh, consider your risk tolerance. Different types of investments carry different levels of risk and it's important to choose investments that align with your risk tolerance, okay? Diversify your portfolio, I like it. It is important to diversify your portfolio by investing in a mix of different asset classes. Look at that, they're getting fancy. Contribute to an employer-sponsored retirement plan. All right, that's good. Review and rebalance your portfolio regularly. By the way, uh, as space permits, I will cut and paste uh, some of these into the uh, below the video. There's a limit to how much I can paste, so I won't be able to do them all. But that's a pretty smart answer. Let's kind of drill down because he mentioned the word asset classes. Let's see. Notice I said he, it, <laughs> pardon me, it uh, mentioned asset classes. So what are asset classes? And can you list a few examples? Let's try to get even more specific. Broad categories of investments that have similar characteristics and they're subject to the same hmm, laws and regulations. Okay. Different asset classes perform differently over time. Fine. Oh, here we go. We've got stocks. That's good. We've got bonds. Looks like it's describing them correctly. Cash. Oh, and fancy cash equivalents, right? Real estate, commodities, alternative investments. I mean, I, the more I, I read the, these responses, I think it may put me out of a, of a job. <laughs> just, 
You guys, you won't need to go to websites and YouTube. Just go to ChatGPT. Okay, let's get uh, more specific. What is a reasonable, no, we'll, we, don't, we don't need to get fancy. What is a good portfolio for retirement investing? I don't know. They say it will, the, the, a good portfolio will depend on your personal financial situation. Talks about diversification, fine. Long-term focus, that's obviously very important. Risk management. It may be appropriate to shift your portfolio to a more conservative allocation in order to protect your savings from market volatility. Certainly true as you near retirement. Mm. So still at a very high level. Um, I'm going to try something else. Uh, what is the three fund portfolio? Does it know about this? The type of investment and strategy that involves holding just three mutual funds or exchange traded funds. That's impressive. They consist of domestic stock fund, international stock fund, and bond fund. Huh. By holding just these three funds, investors can gain exposure to a broad range of asset classes. That's true. The specific funds included in the three fund portfolio may vary depending on the investor's goals. Okay. For example, an investor with a higher risk tolerance may choose a domestic stock fund that focuses on small cap stocks. And I think it goes a little off the rails there. I wouldn't, I wouldn't have a three fund portfolio and, and have all of the U.S stocks and small cap, but okay. Let's let's try something very specific. List uh, funds from Fidelity, Schwab, and Vanguard that I can use to build a three fund portfolio. I'm trying to get really specific here. Like I want the ticker symbols or the names of them. Let's see what we get. All right, Fidelity, Schwab, Vanguard. Oh, look at this. We even use colon and bullet points. And we've got tickers. How about that? Fidelity 500 index fund. Good. FXAIX. That's a good one. Fidelity International. Perfect. Total bond. I mean, that's perfect. There you go. There's a Fidelity 3 fund. What do we get for Schwab? We get the S&P 500. Can't argue with that. International. Good. And we get the, the, the U.S. Ag Bond Index Fund. And for Vanguard, we basically get the same thing. It's interesting that it mixes, and this would, there's no issue with this, but it mixes an ETF here with two mutual funds, one here and one here, uh, not necessarily a problem. Uh, personally, uh, I wouldn't pick that fund as, I'd probably pick VXUS, but I mean, I'm just nitpicking here. This is, I gotta tell you, that's a very impressive answer uh, <laughs> from chat GPT. I mean, that's with specific tickers. Now, one thing I do know, and I'll show you here, let's imagine we wanted the links to these. Uh, can you provide the links to each each of the funds listed above? And what we will learn, I'm pretty sure, yeah. I guess it's a limitation right now of ChatGPT. Uh, it doesn't provide links to, to information on the web. So, you, you know, you wouldn't be able to, to get links uh, to that, uh, in this case, to those funds. So let's try something a little more uh, theoretical. Are index fund, oh no, let's try it differently. Let's say, do index funds perform better <laughs> uh, than actively managed funds? So they start off, a chat starts off by describing what an index fund is. And from what I'm reading quickly here, that gets it right. Um, and then actively managed funds, on the other hand, are funds that are managed by a team of professionals, good. There's an ongoing debate about whether index funds or actively managed funds uh, perform better. On the one hand, index funds have an advantage, and this is good, of being low cost and providing broad market exposure. They also tend to have lower expense ratios. That's perfect. Actively managed funds may have the potential to outperform the market if the fund manager is able uh, to identify undervalued or underperforming securities. It is important to note the past performance. Hmm. They don't really answer the question exactly. They kind of cover both sides, which I guess is fine. How about this? List studies that examine whether index funds outperform actively managed funds. See if we get actually get a list of studies. Wow, that's impressive. So SPIVA, 
That is a well-known report that stands for S and P. It comes the S and P produces it. I is for index, V is versus, and A is active. And they regularly, yearly put out a report uh, that compares index funds to actively managed funds. I, I've used it on the show before, and they give uh, at least two 2020 report uh, showing for, that over the five-year period, uh, we'll call it 83% of large cap funds, 86% of mid cap, and 85% of small cap underperformed their respective benchmarks. Interesting. And then we have a study published in the Journal of Financial Economics in 2015, didn't give the name of it. They just call it a study. That's interesting. What was the, or what is the name of the 2015 study published in the Journal of Financial Economics? Sorry for my slow typing. I don't think it gave us the name. I wonder if it can. Oh, there we go. <laughs> That's amazing. The Persistence of Mutual Fund Performance. The study was conducted by MIT, researchers at MIT, found from 75 to 2013 actively, actively managed large cap funds underperformed their benchmarks by an average of one and a half percent. That's just amazing. So what I want to do now is, and let me see if I can get fancy here. There we go. There I am. Uh, uh, I'm going to get fancy or I'm going to switch gears and say uh, I want to go to the retirement side from the investing side for a moment. Actually, before I do that, let, let me try one other thing. Um, is the three fund portfolio a lazy portfolio? Let's see if it knows lazy portfolio. So it's just repeating what we had up above. The portfolio is often referred to as a lazy portfolio because it is designed to be a simple and cost-effective way to achieve diversification. So it does know lazy portfolio. Let's see how well it knows it. List 10 lazy portfolios. See if it can do that. Let's, again, it's just defining it for us. Oh, it starts off with the three fund and here's the two fund. The all-in-one fund. I don't know if I if that's I don't know if that term is used as a lazy portfolio. Yeah. So light, Vanguard Life Strategy. I mean, you could certainly use that to implement a, the idea of a lazy portfolio. I don't think that's ever been called a lazy portfolio. Same thing with Fidelity Freedom Funds. Same thing with Schwab Target. So here's one example where it's not really giving us lazy portfolios. It's giving us funds and fund families one could use to implement a lazy portfolio. So that's interesting. It doesn't, it, it, for whatever reason, it's it's not giving us what I think anyway uh, of, a, of a correct answer. Okay, so let's switch to retirement. What is the 4% rule? See what it gives us here. Widely used rule of thumb for determining how much money you can spend in retirement. It suggests you can withdraw 4% of your savings in the first year of retirement and then adjust the amount for inflation each year thereafter. Excellent. It gives an example. That's impressive. Uh, it points out here that it's based on a diversified portfolio of stocks and bonds. Very true. Uh, here it points out that it's a general guideline. It may not be appropriate for everyone. So it, it does a lot of, and this is important, but I think it, add, you know, it adds a lot of sort of caveats that, that, that one should add. Um, where does the 4% rule come from? Okay, telling us what it is again. That's fine. Here we go, look at this. Introduced in 1994, correct, by financial planner William Bingen, correct, in a paper titled Determining Withdrawal Rates Using Historical D Data. That is correct. Now, this is not correct. He's, it says it analyzed stocks and bonds over a 40 year period. He actually looked at, at, at retirements beginning from 26 to 76. He actually looked at them over a 50 year period, although he considered, considered a retirement quote unquote successful if the money lasted at least 30 and chat GPT got that correct. That's interesting. Um, so pretty, pretty good all in all. Is the 4% rule still valid today? So again, we get the definition of the 4% rule. That's fine, I guess. It is important to note it's a general rule of thumb, right? Right, true. There's ongoing debate among financial professionals about the validity of the 4% rule. 
Some argue that the rule is still useful, I'm reading here, uh, while others believe that it may be too conservative in today's low interest rate environment. It's going to be too conservative. I would think it's the other way around. Hmm. How about this? List 10 papers discussing uh, the 4% rule. Let's see what it can give us. So the first one is Bill Bangin's paper, 94. Uh, here's Guyton Klinger. We know them. If you if you follow my channel, we've talked about Guyton Klinger. Here's Michael Kitsis' article, a really good one from 2013. I know it well. Uh, I know the, the number four from Blan uh, Blanchett. I don't know Kaplan, but that was 2014 paper. Wade Fowles has written a lot of papers on the uh, on the four percent rule. Here's one from 2015. Uh, Michael Kitsis, another one. Uh, Blanchett again. Uh, these are interesting. Now, again, you don't get links to these, so you would have to, uh, you know, take these uh, titles and track them down in Google. But that's just pretty amazing that ChatGPT can provide um, this kind of, uh, of data on both investing and, 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 and generally and then, and then retirement in the 4% rule. How about this? Um, what is the best stock bond allocation for a retiree. Of course, there's no answer to that. Is it, you know, it's going to be a range, and of course, it starts off that way. It says it depends on a variety of factors. One common approach is to use a glide path. Interesting, it's got, it knows that term, glide path. Investment strategy, which involves uh, gradually shifting from more aggressive to more conservative. Here we go. A general rule of thumb: maintain a stock allocation of 40 to 60 percent in the early years of retirement and then gradually reduce this allocation over time uh, as they approach their later retirement years. Okay, that's a, an approach. Um, interesting. No, no one size fits all. I mean, this is not, this, these are good answers. I mean, you know, you're not gonna put the question into chat to chat GPT and get the answer and then go modify your, your investments accordingly. But overall, I think this is a, a you know, these are reasonable answers. Um, how about this one? I get this question all the time. How much cash should retirees keep in, I'll say in savings? I get this question a lot. Talk about a sufficient emergency fund. That's fine. To cover expenses in the near term. Yep, that makes sense. Some cash for investment opportunities. Hmm. All right. So it doesn't, it doesn't, of course, I wouldn't necessarily expect it to, but it doesn't like give a specific answer. Let's see this. What is the bucket strategy? Let's see if it knows that. It's a financial planning approach that involves dividing your investments into different buckets. The idea behind the bucket strategy is to have a plan in place to manage your money uh, in retirement so that you have a steady stream of income. And it gives us an example. Short-term bucket, interesting, see here, one to two years. And it's mainly money market, short-term bond funds, high-yield savings. The intermediate-term bucket is three to 10 years. I'm looking here. Uh, a mix of stocks and bonds it may include investments such as intermediate-term bond funds. And then the long-term bucket. This is, I mean, that, that nails it. That's at least one version of the bucket strategy. Let's see if they know who created it. Who, I'll call, I'll say created the bucket strategy. We know the answer, right? Harold Avinsky. But does Chat GPT know? 1996 financial planner Harold Avinsky. That's amazing. Mentions the article, the year of the article, 96. That is very impressive. Okay, will stocks go up or down in 2023? Uh, this is the best answer it could give. It's not possible to accurately predict the direction or performance of the stock market. It is generally believed that stocks have the potential. Okay, fine. There it is. Well, I gotta tell you, I, uh, I, I've been playing around with the tool a little bit before I started this video, 
but I am amazed at the answers that it can give. And I view it now as uh, a, another tool I'll use mainly for research uh, because it gives us information in a way that's fundamentally different than what Google or other search engines uh, give us. And, you know, there's been some talk that uh, this artificial intelligence could uh, represent sort of an existential threat to Google. Uh, I, who, who knows? Uh, uh, but this is sort of its, in some ways, its first iteration. And the information it's providing is excellent. One, one, one would wonder, could it, could it do what it does if the, the team behind it didn't have all of the documentation that exists on the internet? Because I gotta believe it's analyzed you know, tons and tons of, of, of written material. In some ways, it reminds me of the new neural net chess engines. In the old days, the old days, you know, 10 years ago, uh, the way you'd program a chess engine uh, or chess program generally would be a bunch of grandmasters would be part of the team. They would uh, pre-program opening moves uh, into, the, into the system. And then uh, to evaluate any chess position, you know, there'd be sort of these heuristics, these rules of thumb, and they would constantly be refining it so that they could tell the computer, here's how you evaluate a chess position. The new neural nets, and I kind of put them into this category of artificial intelligence, that's not what they do at all. Uh, you know, they effectively, again, understand I was an English major, so uh, keep that in mind, but they effectively say, here, here are the rules to the game, uh, computer program. Now you go and you play through millions of games that have already been played, and you basically teach yourself how to play chess. And those programs are now the best in the world uh, and certainly can beat very easily, uh, maybe not easily, but will certainly beat uh, even the best grandmasters in the world. In some ways, ChatGPT reminds me of those, those new uh, chess engines that have come out over the last few years. I can only imagine as good as what, what we just saw from ChatGPT, what, what's it gonna look like a year from now, five years from now, 10 years from now? I have the sense that it could sort of re revolutionize, at least in some ways, um, how we re retrieve information and how we think about uh, information, in this case, on investing in retirement. But of course, uh, you could apply this to uh, presumably just about any uh, scope of knowledge that you wanted to, to, to learn about. And uh, I got to tell you, I think the, 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 the output that we got, they, they weren't perfect uh, and there were some mistakes, but overall I was very impressed. Well, there you go. That's chat GPT, some questions on investing in retirement. Uh, it's free to use at least at the moment. So, you know, give it a try. Uh, if you have any questions, uh, I probably can't answer them, but I will try. So leave them in the comments below. And until next time, remember the best thing money can buy is financial freedom.